So last year I made a video on how and why I think World War One tanks should be added to War Thunder. And if you haven't seen that video, I would recommend you go and watch it. And basically today we're going to continue that video by taking a look at the tanks that we could expect to be added to War Thunder from the World War One era. And we're going to be starting off with Germany or Imperial Germany to be precise. So when looking at the German use of tanks in World War Two, of course, they were a very famous user of tanks. And they've got many famous designs like the Tiger tanks, the Panther, etc, etc. But it is sometimes forgotten that Germany wasn't always at the forefront of tank technology. And indeed, we can see that during World War One, Germany was sort of quite behind in regards to producing tanks. With Britain and France operating tanks for almost two years before Germany, who were somewhat caught off guard by this new development. I mean, they weren't a complete stranger to the use of armoured vehicles, but they didn't seem to prioritise it as much. And it is somewhat easy to understand why this was the case, because of course Germany was on the defensive on the Western Front for large parts of the war, where tanks probably wouldn't have been as much use to them. While on the Eastern Front, early tanks were so unreliable uh, that they would basically be useless in the fast expanses of the Eastern Front. But that said, Germany did make use of a large number of captured Allied tanks, and while they were behind Britain and France, they did start the development of their own domestic tank designs. They were far too late to go into service in large numbers, but we do have a decent number of rather cool and interesting designs, which we will be looking at today. So we'll start off with the A7V, which was a design headed up by Joseph Vollmer. And this does seem to have taken more inspiration from French tanks rather than British tanks, which of course had the rather famous rhomboid shape during World War I. It was also the only German tank to go into operational service and actually be produced in any decent numbers. It also took part in the only tank versus tank engagement of World War I, which is usually considered a bit of a draw because the Germans knocked out two British tanks armed only with machine guns before a British tank with a six pounder forced the German tank to retreat, whereupon it broke down. I mean, on the face of it, you might think it's a German victory, but again, they only had 20 tanks for the entire war that they produced. So, you know, losing one of them for two British tanks of which they had hundreds is not exactly a great result. So, like with most other tanks of its day, it was armed with a whole multitude of weapons, with its main armament being a 57mm Maxim Nordenfelt quick-firing gun in the nose of the tank, which was capable of firing solid shot and HE shells, making this a decent if not spectacular weapon for against enemy tanks. Six 7.92mm machine guns made up the rest of the armament, two being placed on each flank and two at the rear of the vehicle leaving only the 57mm gun for the forward defence of the tank. Suffice to say, with that many weapons, the A7V had a rather large crew to man said weapons, with the official crew count being 18, but additional crew were sometimes carried as and when needed. But assuming that we'll stick with just 18 crew in game, this would make the A7V a rather tough tank to take down, as well as providing a lot of redundancy in the case of crew losses. The mobility of the A7V was also pretty good for a 30 ton tank, with its two 100 horsepower Daimler engines giving it a top speed of 10 miles per hour or 16 kilometers an hour on flat terrain. Though of course it would suffer if crossing the sort of terrain that was common on the Western Front, like trenches and shell scarred terrain. To top things off, the armor of the A7V is pretty good, with the frontal plates being 30 millimeters thick and 15 millimeters for the rest of the tank which is a pretty impressive figure considering the British Mark V's only maxed out at 16mm, which is only 1mm better than the A7V's side armour. In War Thunder, this would be a pretty tough tank, able to take a lot of punishment while also able to devastate enemies with return fire, while still retaining decent mobility on the battlefield. As for its placement, I would suggest a better rating of around 0.3, maybe 0.7, depending on its effectiveness, and this would probably be the bog standard German tank that most players would use from the World War I era. Of course, the Germans knew that the A7V wasn't the best design, and they did work on numerous other designs, but none of these actually entered full service. But most of them were available in a prototype form and thus could be included in War Thunder to help boost Germany's low World War I tank numbers. One of these was the A7VU which was developed after Germany captured its first British tank in April 1917, prompting a design based on the rhomboid shape of the British tank. Thus, the A7VU heavily resembles British tank designs of the day, having tracks that go all around the tank, and mounting its main armament of two 57mm guns in sponsons on either side of the tank, 
as well as four to six machine guns for anti-infantry defence. The design wasn't ready until June 1918, and after trials it was found to have performed quite poorly, so remained a one-off example. There aren't a lot of articles or information on the other stats, but from the information I could find, it seems to weigh about 39 tonnes, nine more tonnes than the regular A7V, and it had an armour thickness of 30 to 20 millimetres, with a crew of seven. Again, 11 crew less than the regular A7V. Regardless, I think it could go at a battle rating of 0.3 to 0.7, as its armament could potentially be a bit more effective now that it has the two 57mm guns, and it would fare a little bit better on muddy terrain. And I could see this being a bit of a side grade to the A7V, so you've got one more gun than the A7V, but you've got less crew, and potentially it's going to be a little less manoeuvrable on flat terrain, but will potentially do better on rough terrain, although, like I say, it didn't perform very well in the trials, so we'll have to see how it would perform in-game. There was also some sort of primitive anti-air vehicle design that seems to have been in testing towards the end of World War I, with at least three chassis being used for testing. So two of these seem to have been armed with two Russian 76.2mm guns, mounted at the front and rear of the tank on an open fighting platform. Now at least one example had one German 77mm gun instead. The crew would likely number around 10, presumably four for each gun and a commander and driver, though the one gun variant would likely have a crew of six. While I suspect speed would be worse than the original A7V on account of the weight of the guns. It's somewhat doubtful it would have been all that useful against enemy aircraft, especially with the ammunition of the day, but they could potentially be used as tank destroyers, being extremely vulnerable to enemy fire, but packing one or two powerful guns, which could easily deal with most tanks. And so I would place the one gun variant at a battle rating of 0.3, and the two gun variant at 0.7, where I think these would make decent if vulnerable tank destroyers, making them somewhat unique amongst the World War I tanks. So the A7V, like I say, is probably the most well known of German tank designs of World War I, but there was also a design for a light tank, as by this point the French Renault FT-17 had been produced in the thousands, and was outclassing the medium tank designs of the day, with there being 5 to 10 of these smaller FT-17s for every medium tank, where they were able to outflank and overwhelm German positions with B-swarm tactics, which were rather difficult to deal with, especially with the lack of anti-tank weapons of the day. So Germany set about designing the Leichter Kampfwagen, or LK-1 light tank, with Joseph Vollmer taking the lead on the design once again, now seeing the light tanks as being the future over the cumbersome, medium and heavy designs. The LK-1 was only armed with a 7.92mm machine gun in a revolving turret, and was considerably lighter than the A7V, weighing in at 6.9 tonnes, compared to the A7V's 30 tonnes achieving a top speed of around 8.6 miles per hour or 14 kilometers an hour, but the armor only really maxed out at around 8 millimeters and was less in other areas. Two prototypes were produced, but due to the thin armor, the tank would be vulnerable even to fire from infantry weapons. Plus there were other minor issues, so no production orders were forthcoming. But thankfully Volmer had already started developing an improved design named the LK-2. Now, some of you may recognise this vehicle as we have partially covered it on the channel before, under the guise of the Swedish STRV M21 and the improved M21-29 variant, as unassembled LK2s were smuggled to Sweden after the World War I to produce the STRV M21. Compared to the LK1, this new tank could retain the machine gun in a turret, or be armed with a casemate-mounted 57mm gun which would give it a fair chance against enemy tanks, although the limited traverse of a casemate would be a disadvantage for the tank. Though I'm not 100% sure if it would have any secondary armament, so it would be somewhat vulnerable to infantry and unarmoured vehicles. The armour is also better than the LK-1s, with a maximum armour thickness of 14mm, but a minimum of 12mm for the flanks and rear. And some sloping has been used, which does help to maximise protection though the use of riveted armour is a disadvantage. The mobility is broadly the same, or maybe slightly improved, with some sources stating a top speed of 10 miles per hour or 16 kilometers an hour, while others state that it has the same top speed as the LK-1. The crew count is a bit unclear, as it could in theory be operated by two crew members, a driver and a gunner, but in Swedish service they had a crew of four, 
as there was room for up to four additional machine guns to be mounted, but it's unclear if the Germans would have done this, so I suspect we'd have a crew of at least two, maybe three if you include a loader for the main gun. But like I say, I'm not 100% sure on that one. Again, like the LK-1, only two prototypes were built, but this time there was an order for 580 additional tanks. And although production had started, none were actually far enough along to enter service, with the various unassembled tanks hidden across Germany, and then sometimes sold on to other nations, like I mentioned earlier, Sweden, but also Hungary, who also had to keep the tanks hidden because they were also technically banned from having tanks, and so they basically kept them hidden until they felt it was safe enough to reassemble them and use them as training tanks. In War Thunder, I would suggest adding the LK-2 at a battle rating of 0.3, as its 57mm gun would be at a disadvantage due to the limited traverse, but it should perform pretty well in flanking attacks, being faster than the contemporary French and British medium and heavy tanks of the day, as well as being a counter to the fast French FT-17 and British Whippet tanks. I suspect the LK-1 wouldn't be added, but if it was added, I'd just add it as a uh, battle rating 0.0, .0 tank, because I can't imagine that machine gun's going to be too useful for anti-armor work, to be honest, although it does have the turret at least. So, we've looked at the light and medium German tank designs of World War I, but Germany also designed and almost finished a heavy tank design called the K-Wagen, or K-Wagen. And here we see some of the design philosophies that we tend to associate with German tank designs of World War II. Namely, the fact that it was an absolutely monstrous tank that was originally slated to weigh in at 150 tonnes. But Vollmer was brought in to assist the project and he managed to trim it down to a more manageable weight. A mere 120 or 100 tonnes, depending on what source you're using. The vehicle was still massive though, being 13 metres long, 6 metres wide and around 3 metres tall. So in the same length as the French Char 2C, while still being double the width and weighing almost 50 to 70 tonnes more. Naturally, this amount of weight would require a huge amount of power to get moving, which was provided by two 650 horsepower naval engines, providing an estimated top speed of 4.6 miles per hour or 7.5 kilometres an hour, meaning this vehicle would be extremely slow and easy to outflank, though it should be little troubled by most obstacles at least, because, you know, it could probably just crush them to be honest. To offset the threat of flanking attacks, this monstrosity was to be fitted with four 77mm guns, with these guns to be fitted in sponsons on the sides of the tank, so two in each sponson, and there would be one facing forward and one facing rearwards. And these were capable of firing solid shot, HE and shrapnel shells. Seven 7.92mm machine guns made up the remainder of the armament, these being positioned covering all flanks of the vehicle, other than a minor blind spot at the rear. Again, this would have required a ridiculously large crew, this time numbering 27, which would make this a very hard to knock out vehicle, as due to its large size it will be almost impossible to achieve a one hit kill on the vehicle by knocking out all of the crew, and there would be a lot of redundancy in the case of crew losses. I mean, if you lose an entire gun crew, you can just take them off of the machine guns and still have crew spare to, you know, replace other losses. Lastly, like with the A7V, it is a fairly heavily armoured vehicle, with the front and sides of the K-Wagen coming in at 30mm thick, which like with the A7V was pretty good for the day, while 20mm of armour on the roof would make this pretty tough to take out from enemy aircraft and even some large calibre HE shells. Ultimately, the K-Wagen was only ordered in small numbers, with only 10 being ordered, and only 2 actually being anywhere near a ready state but one of these was so near to completion at the end of the war that it was practically ready to go on trials. But unfortunately, at the end of the war, the Allied Control Commission ordered them scrapped, so unfortunately they were just never tested, which would have been a great help in, you know, seeing how it would have actually performed, but, you know, there we go. But in theory, as this tank was mostly finished, it could potentially be added to War Thunder, and due to its large array of weapons, thick armour and large crew, I could see this vehicle being introduced at around battle rating 0.7, as it would be a very tough tank to take down, but would still be a threat to any World War 1 era tank, and even some interwar or early World War 2 tanks, which would make this a pretty effective weapon in the hands of experienced players, and let's be honest, it probably would become something of a meme tank like the TOG-2 or CHAR-2C, and if added, it would be nice for players to learn a bit more about this tank, and just get it a bit more attention in real life as well. 
So that is all of the domestically developed German tanks. But Germany also started a tradition during World War I that they would become much more famous for during World War II, which was the reuse of captured Allied tanks, the Beutepanzers. Now, this was principally British Mark IVs, but they did also capture British Whippet tanks, uh, French Renault FT-17s, and, and a few French Schneider CA-1s. Though, like I say, not all of these were actually used in combat, and it was principally British Mark IVs. I think I've heard the figure of around 50, but it may be a little bit more or less than that. And most of these were just reused as they were. They just repaired them and sent them out for the same armour and an armour and such. But a few were re-armed. So some British Mark IV males, the ones that were armed with six-pounder guns, were given the 57mm Nordenfelt guns as on the A7Vs. And some of the British Mark IV females, so tanks that were only armed with machine guns, were armed with the males a tank gevier anti-tank rifle which could penetrate, I believe, about 26 millimetres of armour. So that should be a decent threat against enemy tanks, though of course it is only an anti-tank rifle, so it's not going to be firing the biggest round in the world. And it's probably not going to have the best fire rate. But obviously these tanks could be included in the German tech tree, or they could even be included as premium vehicles for the World War I era. And they would probably go around the same battle rating as their allied counterparts. So that concludes our look at German tanks from the World War One era that I would like to see added to War Thunder. And I have to say we have got some very good examples that could be added here. It also goes to show what we might have seen in German service if they had started developing tanks a little bit earlier. As like I said earlier, most of these are prototypes and only the A7V actually entered service. And again, only 20 of those. But I'd like to hear your opinions on these tanks, as well as any other tanks you would like me to cover and I look forward to reading your comments below. So I hope you've enjoyed the video, and I hope you'll join me for the next one. I've been Toreno, and I'll see you next time.